Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Hi, um, my name is Chris Gobler. I'm a professor at the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook University, and I am the uh, director of academic programs for the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, also known as SOMAS. Um, I'm the director of SOMAS here in Southampton. Uh, we'll be getting our lecture started momentarily, but I just wanted to give a brief introduction. Um, I see many new faces. I'm glad that, uh, to see all the new faces here. Uh, as a way of introduction, we, the lecture you're attending tonight is part of a public lecture series that we have um, September through December, so during the academic semesters, December, September through December, uh, and then again in the spring, March through uh, June. Uh, every year. So it's, u it's usually the first Friday of every month. Uh, but you may recall the first Friday of this month was a little bit different. Uh, we were just post-storm and, um, and so we canceled that lecture. And in addition, we changed the lecture topic because of the very timely occurrence of Superstorm Sandy um, afflicting, afflicting the New York uh, area. And um, uh, before I talk about that, I'll mention, I see our speaker, Dr. Bowman, is here. That's great. Um, I will mention, that, again, this is part of our lecture series, our final um, seminar of the fall series wraps up on December 7th. And uh, our Professor Janet Nye, who's a fisheries uh, biologist, will give a talk that's called Shifts Happen, How Will Climate Change Affect Fish and Fisheries? So that's on Friday night, December 7th at 7.30. That also happens to be the night of the windmill lighting, which is a decades-old um, tradition here in the Southampton campus. So the windmill lighting will occur that evening. Uh, I believe that's going to be at 5 o'clock. So I'd encourage you to come for that. There's going to be uh, refreshments and some food and some other activities thereafter in this building. And then it'll all wrap up with the lectures. So I'm hopeful that uh, you'll be able to come uh, on that night, December 7th, to hear about climate change and fisheries. Um, but tonight, of course, we've put together a special lecture. Um, our speaker tonight is distinguished professor Malcolm Bowman, who's been at the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, although it was formerly, when he started, it was called the Marine Sciences Research Center. Um, what year did you start, Malcolm? 19... I don't remember. Come on, you can, <laughs> you can tell us. 1971. 1971, so one of the first faculty uh, of MSRC, which of course, for those of you who don't know, MSRC was founded as the Sea Grant College in the state of New York. Um, and in fact, to this date, we're the only institution that grants undergraduate marine sciences degrees uh, in New York State, as well as masters and PhD degrees. Um, but so Malcolm's been with MSRC, SOMAS, uh, for quite a while. He's a physical oceanographer and he founded the Storm Surge Research Group at Stony Brook University. And, um, and so Malcolm along with other professors has been modeling and trying to understand the effects of coastal storms, both hurricanes and nor nor'easters, on storm surge. And obviously in the past few weeks we've all become very intimately aware of the effects of storm surge on the New York metropolitan area. Um, so they're a great group. They've learned a lot about how storm surge can affect uh, coastal ecosystems. And um, so I think with that, I'll probably leave it to Malcolm to, I, I should say, before he starts to talk, that he's been so busy since the storm, leading up to the storm, he's been contacted uh, by press agencies literally around the globe. So BBC, CNN, New York Times. Um, I mean, I, I, how many interviews have you done since the end of October, would you say? Well, I had one this morning with uh, MSNBC, but they wanted to go into the city, but I say that's impossible, so we do it by Skype. So I was just set up this morning at 11 a.m. There's a show called uh, Thomas Roberts News Hour or something. I don't know if you can see it, but so there I was at home in front of my computer listening to the news broadcast <coughs> with all this important stuff like uh, General Petraeus. <laughs> 
It's a good thing you didn't go to the city for that. <laughs> so anyway, please welcome Dr. Malcolm Bowman. Thank you. Do you want to put this clip on? Oh, thank you, Chris. Um, my Boy Scout training came uh, in good stead because I thought to myself this afternoon, you know, be prepared. So I sent Joe my PowerPoint, which I just threw together at 5 o'clock, by email in case something went badly wrong. Well, bless his heart, here it is, and it's already on the screen. So how do I change the pictures? Now I can't put my glasses on while you put this. <laughs> it's been quite a day. It takes two, it takes two PhDs. Yeah, that's right. How many, <laughs> how many professors does it take? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yep, got it. Oh, well, thank you, Chris. Actually, Chris, um, this is his title. He actually chose it. I said, what do you want me to call it? So anyway, so what I want to tell you about is um, the experience of the last two and a half weeks. And it has been a kind of a media blizzard, which I have never experienced in my life. It's just amazing. And I've done nothing else since the storm came in fielding calls and being interviewed and stuff. Because this, um, and you might say, well, why is that? Why is that? Why, why, why would they bother calling me? So uh, you let, you'll, you'll discover as we go along that my middle name is Noah. And um, going back as far as 2004, when we started the research group, we started making predictions based on our, our developing understanding of extreme weather events, hurricanes and winter nor'easters, that it was only a matter of time before New York City got walloped. And so I wrote an uh, op-ed piece in the New York Times in 2005. And that was my first experience of writing an op-ed piece. In the New York Times, they only take about 2%. They don't even tell you if you've been rejected. They just say, if you haven't heard from us in a week, go away. So well, guess what? They, they accepted it. But then they started censoring what I had said, which was really surprising to me. I, it was written just after Katrina. I said, my title was, um, New Orleans had just been drowned. Is New York City next? And uh, the editor said, oh, Mr. Bowman, that's too provocative. <laughs> You've got to tone it down. So they actually changed the title. They actually censored what I said. They called it a city at sea. But the bottom line of that editorial was that it was just a matter of time before New York City got pounded. Now, one thing that Chris told you was all wrong. Oh, I just let me pay tribute, firstly, to the people in the research group. Uh, I won't go through all the names, but these are faculty, colleagues, students, former students, and so forth. And over the years, our chief sponsor has been New York Sea Grant, but with help from the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, HydroQual, which is a consulting firm in New Jersey, and out of the blue, a little foundation in New York called Epley Foundation for Research, Inc. And it turns out that I am not who you think I am. I was actually born in 1854. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an, I'm an Irish railway engineer. <laughs> and I became locomotive superintendent of the Belfast and Northern Counties Railway, BNCR, at the age of 22. And I was an advocate of compound locomotives to that. So that's who I am. <laughs> and OK, so let's uh, talk about Hurricane Sandy, which, uh, and these are just some satellite pictures of what uh, looks very much like uh, any other, any other uh, hurricane. Hurricanes have their birth, their genesis in the tropical Atlantic Ocean, and they derive their energy from the hot waters, surface waters of the tropical ocean. And that's the engine that feeds their power. So hurricanes only keep their fury th and their intensity if they stay over warm or hot uh, waters. So uh, coming up the east coast, of course, we have the Gulf Stream. And so that's 
That is like a, a stove that will, can supply its heat energy to the hurricane and keep it going. But uh, Sandy was really not a classical hurricane. This, doesn't, this, this cyclone, there's the eye of the hurricane right there. Here's Florida, Georgia, and so forth, and the battery's going flat on this. Uh, Chris didn't have any more batteries, do we? Nope, ne never mind. Um, it's got this rather strange shape. It became, became known as a hybrid storm, a hybrid between a classical hurricane and what we call an extratropical nor'easter, which we usually experience in the winter. Um, this is a complicated picture, but it's just to show you that uh, this is uh, actually radar looking down from space, and these white columns uh, are not icicles, but that actually is where the rainfall is occurring. This is the eye of the hurricane right in the center, and round the, round this, round the edge is what's called the eye wall, and that's where most of the, the rains and the strongest winds are, and then there are bands of rainfall beyond that. So it's bands outside bands outside bands, almost concentric. Um, you probably see, you all saw pictures like this. Um, there's always um, difficulty in predicting in the early days of the hurricane as it progressed up from the Caribbean, just where exactly it's going to go. The, the actual hurricane is actually carried by the prevailing winds. So closer to the equator, the trade winds will move it towards the west, and as it progresses north, up here, then it can curl around and start heading east. We live in the latitude of call, called the 40s, and the prevailing winds are the, are the opposite direction to the trades, and that's during colonial days, the sailing ships would come at low latitudes from up the east coast and go back to Europe to the north. But the question was, where was it going to make landfall? So these are a, a different hours through the day on Tuesday, uh, and it was clear, became clear to the meteorologists that there was something different about Sandy, and it was not going to just keep shooting up the coast like most were going to do, but it was predicted to take a sharp turn to the left, to the west, somewhere in New Jersey. It was very unusual. I've never seen anything like this before, and most, most uh, meteorologists have not seen something like this before. So what be could, could be causing that? Um, this is a, a plot from the, uh, the Huffington Post. And this shows in detail what the actual track of the hurricane was. And has anybody got any batteries in their pocket? Um, what does it need? I have a little laser pointer on my keychain. It's pretty feeble. Nope, that's not good. Anyway, it came ashore <laughs> right about uh, just north of Baltimore and then shot up over land. Once the hurricanes are over land, they lose their source of energy. It will, um, well, good for you. They can still unleash a lot of wind, a lot of destructive power, a lot of rainfall, but they, they, fizz, they tend to fizzle out. This, uh, this here is an extract from the National Weather Service which puts out advisories. They will only put out advisories if they declare that this storm, in fact, is a hurricane. And a hurricane can be category one, two, three, four, five. It's extremely rare, it would be almost impossible to have a category five this far north of the equator. Katrina was a, was a, I think, a, a five, and then it went down to a four, then across the Gulf of Mexico, and it ran over a gigantic ocean eddy called an anticyclone hot water went back up to a five and then wallop New Orleans. Ah, here we go. Thank you. And so it took this rather strange uh, twist to the west. Now the National Weather Service said this came out on Monday the 29th. That's just when it made landfall. Don't need to read all of it. Aircraft data, satellite data indicate that Sandy made landfall near Atlantic City in New Jersey around midnight. The intensity of the cyclone was estimated to be about near 80 knots at landfall with a minimum pressure of 946 millibars. At landfall, the strongest winds were occurring over water to the east and southeast of the center. That's up here. Well, here's Long Island right here. Right? 
Hurricane force wind gusts have been reported across Long Island and the New York metro area this evening. In addition, a significant storm surge has occurred along a long stretch of the mid-Atlantic and southern New England coast. All right, sounds serious, but it doesn't sound anything dreadful, does it? Uh, they don't say run for the hills. <laughs> uh, what was the reason why this thing took, the, why this hurricane took this sudden turn to the west? Now this is a, a map looking down, it's like a weather map looking down on the top of the earth. This is the North Pole in the center. And can you see North America here? And we are just about there somewhere. And this is the, what's called the jet stream, which goes around the, the Earth. It's a high altitude wind. You all know about the jet stream. But if you look here, this red blob, the jet stream takes this big curvature, and it comes around like that. And now it's sort of heading to the northwest. This is Canada. And then it curls around itself, comes down again. This is called a blocking high. This is a sort of a stationary meander, if you like, in the, in the, in the uh, jet stream. And it was stopping the hurricane, here's the hurricane here, stopping the hurricane progressing normally, but the, the winds are going like this, around the cyclone, and so they got pushed to the west. And that was the basic reason why it had this very unusual behavior. Now, <laughs> a, a, lot of, a lot of pictures have come out about this. If you go on Google Images, <laughs> any of you could give this lecture tonight because you can just go to Google Images like I did, and there's just thousands of wonderful pictures. This one caught my attention, <laughs> um, but unfortunately, well, fortunately, it's not real. It's a fake, <laughs> like most mo like most things in life. It's fake. So, however, this one is real. This was uh, given to me by uh, my colleague Brian Colley. This is a um, is it? I can't read that. It's Rockaway Beach or something. But anyway, it's near the Rockaways, and these were huge waves coming in. Um, in fact, the, there are the, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, has a series of anchored ocean buoys. They're all peppered around the ocean, and they, they bring, send back information by radio and satellite in real time. And they were measuring waves of 35, to 35 feet high. This was a record for what we call the New York Bight since uh, these buoys were out there in 1975. So 25 plus 12 plus 37 years, this was an all-time record. So they look dangerous, and I don't see anybody trying to surf. <laughs> this was an interesting map put out by, uh, was put together by CBS News based on information coming from the National Weather Service. These are the areas that were considered to be flood prone, and you can see it covers all of the, uh, all the river there, the <coughs> Delaware River up to Philadelphia, up the east coast of uh, New Jersey, which took the brunt of the damage, actually. <coughs> and around here in the metro region, doesn't show up very well, but uh, Staten Island here that took a while for you. Then the south coast of uh, Long Island. Many of you know, know uh, new inlets were punched through the barrier beaches on the south shore, Fire Island National Seashore, um, in Great South Bay. And we have people at Stony Brook uh, looking into that and to see watching that to see if these inlets are going to grow or whether there's going to be an intervention and have them sealed up by the Army Corps of Engineers. Since it's part of, some of them are part of the National Park, Fire Island National Seashore, their, their tendency is to leave nature alone. This is part of natural progression. So we'll see what happens. Um, now this is sort of a, I got a chuckle out of this this afternoon because this is called a crisis response map. And I would say there's some kind of crisis going on, <laughs> even if you didn't know that there was a big hurricane coming. Um, it's kind of ridiculous because I, you, I can't click on this one, but I just clicked on those, on that jumble of little m pyramids of exclamations. And every time you click the one, you get a you get a message like this. <laughs> this is supposed to help people evacuate, right? <laughs> Abnormal load delays. Travel time alert on U.S. Highway 206. Delays on U.S. 206 northbound area of blah, 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 Flanders Road. Delays due to volume. Everywhere you click, it said road closed, construction, don't go there. It was absolutely useless. 
in my opinion, if you were trying to flee the coast, I know I'm being a bit sarcastic, but it's late at night, right? So, so let's look at some pictures of the, of the um, this is in New Jersey, uh, I forget the name of the town, but you can see there that this community has decided to, uh, um, I don't want to make light of all this because it's tragic, but basically the whole community is uh, underwater and there's uh, some very expensive looking homes. These are some pictures now I took. Uh, near Stony Brook we have a salt marsh that we, uh, we treasure, it's a sort of relatively Un, un, undeveloped little salt marsh, but I went up to Black Pond on the, would have been what, Monday afternoon, and there was a ferocious wind coming through. I don't have the movies that go with it, but you can, you can, uh, you get the idea. This is looking uh, out on Long Island Sound, and this is from the, there's a lighthouse, a place called Oldfield, and was, these are the huge waves coming in from the east. And one reason we'll see in a minute why the, the surge was so great in Sandy was that the, not only was the surge coming into New York Harbor from the south through the Verrazano Narrows, but it was coming through Long Island Sound. If you think of the orientation of Long Island Sound, it's sort of east-west or northeast-southwest, and it's like a funnel shape. So if you get these strong winds blowing, this is coming from the east towards us, it funnels water in the western, western sound and it squirts through the East River, of which Doug Hardy here is a world export, expert and taught me everything I ever knew about the East River many years ago, right? Well. Yes, you did. <laughs> You're so modest. And Doug's early discoveries is, is, is classic work. We still use his understanding of the East River and how that works. But anyway, so the city, New York Harbor, gets a double whammy. He gets a surge coming up from the south and then a knockout punch from the east. But the funny thing was, this is Flax Pond. This is just inside a little barrier beach. And the ra these raging waves are just outside there, a few feet away. And there are these people going for a canoe ride. I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting how localized some of these surges and these winds can be. And then, of course, this is around Stony Brook. Suddenly, all the trees started falling down. And you probably had similar experiences out here, maybe not quite as bad. but. I was driving along, and uh, behind this truck, and suddenly a tree fell on the truck. And the man jumped out, but he was a real scared rabbit, and he didn't wait. He just jumped in the back seat of my car and said, get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who are you? <laughs> so I tried to take him home, but the trees were falling down. He lives on a place called Crane Neck. And so I said, I can't go any further. I'm going to get killed too. So you better get out and run home. So he scrambled out. <laughs> And I ran up my street and found all my neighbors' cars are getting squashed too. So, um, so well, being the resource, resourceful Boy Scout, we have a little barbecue. We heat our house with wood, so we had wood burning stove. We were warm. We had a pot of boiling water on the stove. We, and guess what? I have a, the old-fashioned copper wire telephone. You know, and even in my garage, I still got an old dial-up one. So you don't need power, right? It has its own power, and for, by some miracle, the telephone wires were still working. So we had the telephone, the water, and heat. What else do you need? No TV, just a crank radio. So we're watching the storm unfold. Um, and the, this is where it gets really interesting, because that night, Monday night, as the news of the storm was being reported, reported on the radio, it was like checking the boxes of all the predictions we, we had made over the last five or six years. There goes the Hoboken train station. It filled up with water 20 years ago in a winter storm, 1992. There goes the path tunnels under the Hudson River. There goes the South Ferry train station. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. This beautiful $530 million train uh, subway station that the city has just opened. There goes the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, now called the Hugh H. Carey Tunnel. Some of you may be old enough to remember him. And, <laughs> and there goes the FDR Drive, and there go the subway tunnels. It was almost like check, 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 and I think, oh my god. So it was really a disaster waiting to happen, and it did. Um, 
Now, you, you all know where, th where this is. Um, last Sunday afternoon, uh, I and two of my adult children decided to see we were in Brooklyn for a family reunion, and we thought we'd try and get down to Breezy Point, which you, I'm sure you heard it was where there was a lot of devastation, a lot of flooding, and a huge fire that took out 111 beach homes. So we, um, we drove down across the bridge here, and I, I talked my way into this community. It's actually, I, I don't know if you know this, it's a cooperative. And this whole community is this cooperative, so it's a sort of like a gated community. It's actually Irish-American. It's kind of interesting. So I was learning as I went along, and I went up to the garden. I said, look, I'm a storm surge specialist. Here's my business card. And she looked at this card and said, this looks like a fake. <laughs> Which it is, because I made it up myself. Because <laughs> I'll pass it around, because President Stanley would fire me if he could, and especially if I use a fake business card. So you pass it around. But Anyway, she said, the guard said, oh, go to that next guard down the road there. So I, we drove down the road, and she was looking the other way. So we just kept going. <laughs> it's not really funny. I know it's, it's tragic, but I'm just trying to keep you awake. So <laughs> we went down here to see what we could see and to study the area and see, you know, how bad the damage really was. So I'm just going to show you some pictures. And it was really, truly dreadful. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but the, the houses, the little houses, and some of them big houses, permanent residences, just stacked next to each other. They're all crammed in together. There are hundreds of them. And every house, most of the houses were still on their foundation. Some have been knocked off and actually washed down the street. You'll see that in a minute. Um, or knocked over like this one. But uh, this was some last Sunday, so it was really almost two weeks after the storm. So the residents have been there just throwing everything out. Their possessions, all their treasures, their children's toys, the insulation in the walls, the sheetrock, the paneling, everything was just being chucked out. And it, the people were kind of stunned. You know, I told my kids, don't go around rubbernecking, gawking. Just look at the ground and walk by when you see people because they don't want you you know, just looking at what's going on. But this is a brand new European sports car, and it looks perfectly okay, but if you look inside the window, it's just full of stuff. It, 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 it had been completely submerged in seawater. So there's something like, I saw today that 200,000 cars were damaged. Anybody else see that? Yeah, that is amazing. That's a quarter of a million cars. What? They could have put them out in Calvert that are on the runway of uh, Essex County. Yeah. And New York is going to bring them all there. And then what? Then Try and start them up again? No. <laughs> you have to remember, this is seawater, folks. This is not freshwater flooding. This is not rainfall. The amount of rain during Sandy was actually quite small. It hardly rained at all. Where in Stony Brook, um, compared to Irene, say, the year before, so once the water touches anything, anything electronic is simply destroyed. Have you ever dropped a cell phone? you ever gone swimming with a cell phone in your pocket? I have. It lasts about a millisecond, and that's it. No matter how you wash it out, it will never go again. It's corrosive. It conducts electricity. It causes humid. So everything is ruined. So you s we saw mile upon mile of these houses. Every the appliances were thrown out, the TVs, everything. And then we went for a walk across the berm to the ocean just to see what was there. What surprised me was how flat it is. See, see, here we are. Here's my daughter looking. The ocean's behind her. Here's, here's the ocean here. Looking across what you call the berm or the, or the sand dunes to the devastated community. Now, you, you can't tell me there's much of a sand <coughs> buildup there. In fact, it's dead flat. So any surge coming off the ocean is just going to just go roaring across there and just washing everything in its path. So and even, even the beach, it's completely flat. So it's offering no protection from the south. These are just some other shots. There were, there were rescue trucks and power repair trucks from all over. 
we saw a big convoy, about six or seven of these huge trucks from Quebec Hydro in Canada. So people were coming in from all over to try and help out. There were a lot of volunteer groups. The, these uh, young people were from a church somewhere in Brooklyn, I presume, and they were just helping people, emptying out their homes, trying to, trying to clean the houses up, dry them out. This, this, I took this photo because th there was a, a garage underneath the house below ground level, and so, you know, that of course was flooded more than anything else, and it was still full of water, so there's no power. How are you going to get that water out of there? These are just signs of devastation, and a little poignant Volkswagen, the child's toy, made you realize that families with young children live there. This is not just a summer place for many people. And then we went to the area that burned out, and this was a dreadful thing to see. It was like, it was like World War II firebombing of Dresden or somewhere. And it was just this huge area where everything was just burned to the ground. As I said, the houses were almost touching, and strong winds coming off the sea just fanned these flames. The fire trucks couldn't get in. The floodwaters were too high. And so they just burned, and it was only because of open space to the north, inland, like big parking lots that stopped the fire from going any further. And you saw all kinds of, this was a bench, a tribute to some, some leading residents, and then the children's teddy bears stacked up. Look at that, I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. It's a miracle nobody was burned alive. So the residents must have taken the evacu evacuation orders very seriously. This is a melted plastic fence. And then somebody's um, a little biblical plaque there, a little um, monument. It's just horrible to see. Now this was uh, this was very touching. This was a little. These are some scraps of sodden paper that the fleeing residents had left behind. But this is a close up, and it says, "Dear Breezy Point, I'm Isabel Loyola." Lo Loyola from Denver, Colorado. I'm in fourth grade, and Ellen Mathis is my teacher. She is a great teacher. I hope you're all okay. I'm pretty sure there are 38 kids praying for you. That's from her class. Here are some paper, pencil, and highlights. Love, Isabel. And then this one here says, Dear people from Breezy Point, I am a kid from Denver, and my teacher is Ellen. I love her accent. It's funny. But I'm sorry for your homes. God will make something good of this, and God will protect you, big or small. God bless. We are praying for you. There's a little Statue of Liberty. So I don't know when they would have got these messages, but there they were. Um, now this, uh, this man and his wife were <coughs> cleaning out their house, number 21, Irving Avenue, he was a retired uh, New York City cop, and he's pointing to this line on the house. That's, what, that's where the water came up to in their house. It was on the foundations, but you can imagine everything inside, everything electrical was ruined. And his wife attributed it to the Virgin Mary on the, on the inside the house that protected them. Now let's go back to my office. So, so the next day on the Monday, this, I guess it was this week, right? Um, suddenly I'm besieged by this TV crew. It's, it's combined uh, BBC and PBS, Public Broadcasting Service, are making two documentaries. And this is what they call a, sh a quick turnaround. Normally documentaries can take up to a year to make, right? This is going to be less than two weeks. In fact, it's showing this Sunday. The PBS, so there's these two, uh, two not-for-profit uh, corporations, the BBC and the PBS, are working together to make two documentaries, one for an American audience, one for a British audience. I don't know if they'll have the same title or not. A lot of the content will be shared. They'll probably have a British commentator on their one, and we'll have an American on ours. It's apparently going to be shown tonight, not tonight, Sunday night. I think it's um, on PBS. I don't know if it'll be a 13, 21, or what, but you'll find it 
It may be, it's either 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. I think it's 7 p.m. here and it's going to be 8 p.m. in London. Um, <coughs> anyway, they, it's not just about me, of course. It's a, I mean, they spent a week in New York looking at all the damage, interviewing people in Staten Island where, where the most of the fatalities were. And anyway, they came to my office and basically on Monday and basically wrecked it. I mean, they, they, they take pictures off the wall, they move things around, furniture around. And this is my son, and I'm supposed to be sitting there working, and there's this huge camera sticking in your face. This is Brian Colley. He's one of our, he's our meteorologist. He's a very, a very distinguished uh, meteorologist, and he's part of our storm surge research group. And his uh, weather forecasting model for the East Coast that we use to make our daily predictions are really good. And so we're, we're trying to uh, scramble to keep things moving. People are asking us for graphics, for animations and stuff. Um, and the other funny thing, on a personal note, um, my wife, Waverly, where, where's, where's Waverly? Where's Waverly? Well, there you are, the back. <laughs> Thought you deserted me. So, <laughs> Waverly's 90-year-old mother was visiting from New Zealand. Our son, our son Hamer standing up there, he lives in New Zealand as well. He's also an oceanographer, and Google flies into San Francisco every year for a conference to do something or other. And so he brought his grandma with him. And so grandma was with us, and suddenly the power goes off soon after she gets here, and it stays off. And what the heck am I doing here? And then Malcolm's running around like a chicken with his head cut off, um, talking on the telephone all day. But she was a good sport. And she'll have some stories to take home. I tell you, she's gone. She's back home safely now. Um, just a little bit of science. I don't know whether you even see these wiggly lines or not, can you? But basically, if you go to our website, I'll give it to you later if you're interested. Um, this is the famous battery tide gauge. The battery tide gauge is at the southern tip of Manhattan. It's called the battery, right? And it's on the Coast Guard station there. It just looks like an outhouse on the dock. But inside the box, this is this electronic gauge that faithfully measures the rise and fall of the tides every six minutes. And it's been doing it for the last 150 years. It's the second oldest one in the United States. The oldest one's in Honolulu, apparently. Because it hasn't been electronic for 150 years. It was probably some guy with a string with a weight on the end. But it's, there it goes up and down. And it's, re it's broadcast live on the internet. And what we're looking at here, this is time. You can't read the numbers, but this is the 29th of October. This is now the midday, 6 p.m., midnight. Now it's the 30th, 6, 12, 1800, which is 6 p.m. And let me just explain what these three lines are. This black line, see the tide going up and down? That's called the astronomical tide. That's the tide that we expect if there is no weather effects. If it's perfectly still, it's a beautiful day, that is the tide you expect. And that's created by the relative movement of the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. Now, we all know that. And the tide comes in twice a day, but every 12 hours, 25 minutes. I'm, I don't have time to tell you why, but it's the way the Moon turns, moves. And that's predictable into the future for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Because it's all the mathematical movement of the, of the moon, the Earth, and the sun. So it's, that's a sort of a reference baseline. Now, what else do we have here? This red line is what our storm surge prediction computers at Stony Brook University produce each night. Every, every night at midnight, our computer starts whirring. We get information from the National Weather Service, from the NOAA, and we run Brian Colley's atmospheric model, weather model, takes two hours, so about 2 a.m. Brian's predicted the weather on the East Coast for the next three days, and then we oceanographers pick up his winds uh, at 2 a.m., and we put them on our ocean model underneath, so it's like a sandwich. Atmospheric model, ocean model, and when I say model, these are computer programs. And that computer, the ocean model has the tides going up and down. The, the, but then what happens? The winds start blowing water around. Right? 
And the winds create waves, we all know that, and the stronger the winds, the bigger the waves, and the faster they move. But also, the, the, the winds just push water around. If that water then pushes up against the coast, it builds up, and that's what we call the storm surge. Part of a storm surge is the waves also, because if the waves break on the beach, say on the south shore, they crash on the beach, and they push up, and they can add another surge on top of the, the wind surge by as much as about that. So what's this red line? This red line is what's observed at the battery. This is this tide gauge that's electronically measuring the water. This vertical line was the time this, this plot was made, 6 p.m. in the evening on Monday night. We've been waiting for years for this big storm. Our computers are whirring. This dashed line is our prediction. It's a little bit low, but it's faithfully following and it's predicting a four meter or about a 13 foot surge occurring at about close to six, 9, 10 p.m. Monday night. And then guess what happens? The whole university has a blackout. <laughs> the whole campus goes black, all our computers are shut down, and we miss it. <laughs> <laughs> we have some records, but we haven't had time to analyze them. But what does this mean? Well, well it means we missed it. But in my defense, in my plaintiff defense, it's a pathetic defense, but you know, you might say, why don't you have uninterruptible power supplies, you know, that you that can automatically generators will come on and keep the computers going. Malcolm, why the heck didn't you do that? Well, we need some more money. So if you'd like to uh, <laughs> pass the hat around, Chris, we'll do that. But seriously, you know, you have to be very careful when you're in research not to pretend you're operational. What do I mean by operational? I don't mean you have operations, but the National Weather Service makes daily weather forecasts, right? That's called operational. And there's a lot at stake on those, on those weather forecasts. I mean, planes make decisions about whether to take off or the land. <coughs> Farmers make decisions about whether to plant crops or harvest their crops. You know, uh, builders decide whether it's safe to go up that skyscraper and put another floor on in those strong winds. So a lot <coughs> depends on the accuracy of those forecasts, and there are legal implications. The, the National Weather Service could get sued if they get it wrong. That's why you say see on the weather forecast there's a 30% chance of rain today. 30%. You know, it's like a sort of, it's like a sort of a probability. And so they're kind of covering themselves a little bit. So we're just this little group of uh, oceanographers and meteorologists at Stony Brook. And even though we have our website is chugging away 24-7, we're very careful to say that this is research only. It's under development. You should never use our results under any circumstances whatsoever to evacuate. This is a big surge. Um, go and talk to your National Weather Service. So we're kind of covering ourselves against any legal consequences. However, having said all that, the National Weather Service does look at this, and they use a whole bunch of things, but this is one of the, our predictions of what they use when you see on the Weather Channel those storm surge predictions, and then those advisories about to evacuate. So, you know, we're doing some good things. We haven't been sued yet. Um, that's the same thing. Uh, now we're going to, well, what are we going to do about all this? We've had this terrible devastation. Um, it's been predicted. It's happened. We're, the day, it's interesting, the day after the, the storm went through, so Tuesday morning, I was listening on my little crank radio, and there was Governor Andrew Cuomo saying from, I don't know where he was, he was Staten Island or somewhere, standing next to the mayor, Michael Bloomberg, saying, look folks, we've got to get real. We're in a different climate era. We've had two 100-year storms 12 months apart, Irene and now Sandy. Let's stop arguing about climate change. Let's do what we have to do to protect our cities. And we're going to need to think about some bold new protection. By that he was meaning some kind of seawalls or levees. And then next to him was Michael Bloomberg. I couldn't see him, but I could hear him. So, no, 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 no. 
we, we've got lots of things we're doing in New York City. We don't need that. It's so expensive. We don't know if it's going to work properly. So these two guys were like this. And I didn't know why, except one of their politicians, of course. But um, it turns out that there's a lot of squabbling going on about the 9-11 Memorial Foundation. This is the foundation which has raised money for the memorial. And it turns out that Mayor Bloomberg is the chairman of that committee, the foundation. But the state of New York is pouring a lot of money in, and there's been a lot of fighting about what to do with the money and how to spend it. So these two guys are... So, well, I just haven't read that. I don't really know how bad it is, but we'll see. Anyway, uh, in August, I was in, uh, we were in the Netherlands. And I have some colleague, uh, have a colleague who's there who used to work for the federal government of, uh, of, of Holland. And as you know, they take this question of storm surges very, very seriously. Half of their country is below sea level. Half of their country is below sea level. To them, the defenses against the ocean, the surges, the storms, is a question of national survival and national security. So they don't mess around. They have the best hydraulic engineers in the world. You know, they have the best w water engineers in the world. They have a special department of uh, coastal protection reports directly to the prime minister of the country. And they have built this uh, amazing, <coughs> it really is amazing, uh, line of protection against the threats to their country. And it's, a co it's not all big engineering projects. It's a combination of strengthening natural sand dunes. And half the country is protected by these strengthened sand dunes, like we see on the South Shore here. And the other half protection is some mm. very amazing engineering structures, which keep the storms out of the major cities. Did you know Amsterdam is six to nine feet below sea level? And did you know that Rotterdam is the same? And it's the world's largest seaport. It's below, the whole town is below sea level. So you've been to, who's been to Holland? You've, you've seen all these canals and all the cities and the boat rides you can take. And it's, uh, they're amazing. But they've got nowhere to run. I mean, Holland's very flat. The population is, I forget, 34 million or something. Um, I mean, nobody wants them, right? Belgium or Germany, they've got nowhere to go. So they can't run for the hills because there aren't any hills <laughs> and they have to stand and fight. And so they have developed these, this system um, and they protect their cities against what they call, uh, what we call a one in 1,000 year storm. A one in 1,000 year sto storm is a storm that's so bad that it's only likely to happen once every thousand years. Now, it's unlikely that we'll ever see one, right? No one, no one lives that long, so how do you know what they are? So, they guess. New York City and I imagine Long Island, the building codes are to protect the city against a one in 100 year storm. That's embedded in the building code, and the building codes are very much a part of the city culture. I'll tell you a funny little story because some years ago I was doing a, a movie shoot for National Geographic and we were down inside this brand new uh, South Ferry train station, the number one subway line that where you get on the Staten Island Ferry. Anybody been to that station? It's, you know, it's a show, real showpiece. And when we were down here three years ago with the chief engineer of the MTA, the Metropolitan Transport Authority, we're on camera and we're sitting in this big concrete box like this unfinished, and there was a stairway up to the blue sky, and I said to uh, the engineer, <laughs> Mr. Trainer, how far above how far above the ocean is the entrance up there at street level? He said, oh, it's the, uh, let me see, it's 11 feet. I said, what? He said, oh, it's even, you know, this roof is uh, more than the, it's about 11 feet, right? Maybe more. So, I said, what? That doesn't sound very much. He said, oh, well, don't worry, we're safe. I said, we're safe? He said, well, that's above the 100-year storm surge level. We're safe. We're safe for 100 years. You and I won't be here. Malcolm, <laughs> relax. And I, <laughs> I said, Mr. Trader, we could have a 100-year storm next week. It doesn't mean it's 100 years away. <laughs> 
He said, Malcolm, look, just, just relax, will you? So we went away. I don't know if that made the movie cut. Well, I, I can't remember. But anyway, guess what? It wasn't a week. I said it happened, happened next week. It wasn't a week. It was like three years. But that was horrible, and it happened. Oh, I said to Mr. Trader, the engineer, why don't you build up the up there? Why don't you build a kind of a ring around the top so people go up, and then they go down, right? Climb up some steps and go down. We'll give you an extra measure of protection. He said, oh, Malcolm, uh, oh, no. Um, people don't like climbing upstairs and going down again. And then people open their car doors, and it bangs the door on these things. And no, we can't do that. Well, what can I say? So it got flooded. And remember again, it's salt water. It just doesn't go away. Anyway, so we're in the Netherlands. Oh, uh, I'm getting losing, running out of time here. But um, here's Amsterdam up the top, and this this Rotterdam, the, the big port on this river, and there's the Hague. The Hague's that famous place where the International Court of Justice is. And I'm going to take this little town here. It's got a funny name. It's called Monster. And my, uh, my friend Garrett Van Dam lives right there, and he said, come and see how we have strengthened our sand dunes. Because I was very interested to see all this stuff. So th that's the Hague. It's, it's a sort of um, seat of government. Just as a side, it's a seat of government. That's where, that's where the, the government is just behind us. But it's not the capital city. The capital city is Amsterdam. Don't ask me why. It's in a lot of things about the Dutch I don't understand. So anyway, now we're on top of this big sand dune that they've nourished. What, what do I mean by that? They've, they've blown dredged sand from the ocean and they've built up the dunes. And I'm standing on top of it. And here's a very quaint seaside village. And there's a windmill back there. And they all look very quiet and serene. And they feel secure because they're behind this big sand dune. So you climb up it, you up some steps and down the other side. And there's a big project going on. This, uh, I can't read Dutch, but there's this big hunk of sand in the ocean. It's a photograph, and there it is over there. They're continually building up their beaches with these big ocean dredges. And we do it on Long Island to a certain extent. But they keep doing it because every winter they get a big storm and it eats away the boom. And there's another view of it. There you can see this big sort of uh, bar out there, sandbar. But here's the dune. See, and it's, got, it's got grasses growing on it. And it protects half of their country. So what can we do about New York? Um, these are just two little clips. I'm not going to read them. This was my editorial, New York Times, 2005. And it says, as we read about the effects of Hurricane Katrina and Rita, remember Rita, on the Gulf states, we have to wonder if the same thing could happen to the metropolitan region. Scarily, it could. And then it goes on and on. And my colleague Douglas Hill wrote just last year, and this got really got the city mad, I have to tell you. They threw him out of a meeting. It says, New York City is planning to be flooded. Now, that's a very provocative thing to go to the New York City Department of uh, Emergency Management and say, Mr. Manager, did you know that you're planning to flood your city? Um, well, he got booted out, so almost. It says here, summary, New York City will inevitably be flooded in a hurricane, but instead of taking measures to prevent possible catastrophic consequences, it is aiming for, quote, resilience. Other major coastal cities have erected storm surge barriers to prevent coastal flooding, and New York can be protected, can be protected in the same way. The city, city should start by performing a comprehensive assessment of the risk of severe coastal flooding and the various alternatives for dealing with it, including storm surge barriers. Well, he's right. And so Doug has been the kind of the, the prophet crying in the wilderness, you know, repent, the end is near. So let's go back to see what the Europeans have done about their cities. This is an aerial view of the part of the coastline of the Netherlands. And this is a picture from an airplane. It's called the Delta Project. Back in 1953, there was this horrendous sandy-type storm in the North Sea, and it pummeled southeast England and the Netherlands and drowned about 800 people. 
And following that, they decided they had to do something. And so they argued about it for decades. Almost 30 years later, the British put what's called the Thames River Barrier, which is a big gleaming silver set of gates just downstream the Thames River from the city of London. And that protects the city from surges coming up the river, which, and they use it about 10 times a year. And there hasn't been any flooding of the city since then. The Dutch needed to be more ambitious because their country is below sea level to start with. And so this is just a sort of uh, aerial photograph of some of their defenses. You have in the, in the foreground here these big nourished dunes. There's a four-lane highway going across this, looks like a bridge, and it is a bridge. But the only difference is that underneath are these big vertical panels that can be dropped down like a guillotine and stops the surge. If this is the ocean on the left here, there's a big surge coming in. They just close all these gates by dropping the guillotines down for a few hours and protects the, stops the surge from getting into the harbor here. And there's a similar thing over there. So this is a kind of a, I don't know what it is, but some sort of boat harbor or place of refuge. So I've been proposing for a number of years now that the city thinks seriously about a similar plan for New York Harbor. <coughs> Three years ago, I helped organize a conference at Brooklyn Polytech. It's now called Polytechnic University of NYU. And this was, uh, it was called Against the Deluge, Storm Surge Barriers to Protect New York City. And we invited major engineering firms to come and present their conceptual designs for storm, various storm surge barriers. We gave them the geographic locations. We gave the British firm, Halcro, the assignment of what we call the Outer Harbor Gateway. This is Sandy Hook, New Jersey. This was the barrier they presented. And this is Breezy Point. Another firm, a Dutch firm called Arcadis, we gave the assignment of designing a barrier that would go across the Verrazano Narrows under the bridge. A third New York firm was an Upper, upper East River assignment and so forth. They all, we said, just go to it, do whatever you want. These are your geographic locations. These are your assignments. See what you can do. That was three years ago. By, by coincidence, the proceedings of this conference have been delayed and delayed for all kinds of copyright reasons. But guess what? The proceedings are coming out December the 3rd. So it's very apropos. And let's take a quick look at this. I know we're running out of time, Chris, right? Time's up. <coughs> Give me about three minutes, OK? So this is a Google map looking down from space, looking to the northwest. Here's New York Harbor. Here's the Verrazano Bridge. This wiggly, dark area is the Ambrose shipping channel. It's the main channel into New York Harbor. And so the Halcro firm have have designed this. So what are we looking at? We're looking at sort of, uh, let's call them, this is an elevated highway. Think of it as a six-lane interstate highway. Okay? And there are gaps. The gaps are designed to let the waters in and out on a normal day. And then in the middle, there's some sort of funny uh, business here. We'll look in detail. This is the big gates that open and allow the ship through. Normally open, day and night, except during a surge. And there's, a small, there's three of them. There's one there for small boats, the main one, another one there for pleasure boats going into Raritan Bay. This was their design. That's my favorite, by the way. And this, what is this? Well, this is what one of these uh, openings would look like. In other words, these spots, these openings here, see those? What is this? Well, this is the system that the Halcrow engineers have built around St. Petersburg, Russia. You, anyone been to St. Petersburg? A few of you have. It's a beautiful city. It's, it's called the Venice of the North. It's, it, in many ways, it's got a lot of similarities to New York Harbor. It's built on the River Neva Delta. It's navigable waterways, like New York Harbor's navigable waterways. It's in a sort of a end of the Baltic Sea. It looks like a funnel, a bit like New York Bight. It's, it's chronically flooded with storm surges. The Soviets got very tired of this, so in the 80s, they started building a, a beltway, if you like, a, an elevated highway that would encircle the city, raised up. It would double as a levee, but it was a major transportation, just like around Washington, D.C. system. 
And then it extends out into the harbour. And there's a big gate to let the ships through. This is actually one of this is a photograph of this under construction. So here's the highway. You can see underneath it's hollow, it's like a bridge. And on the seaward side there are these big they're called the sluice gates or guillotines that would go down and shut when necessary. Only for a few hours when necessary. This is the gates that I'm jumping around a bit, but this isn't actually in the Netherlands, but it's the same arrangement as these swing gates. These are huge. And they're shut now, and the surge would be coming in from the left if there was one. And But during normal weather, they, they hinge back and they, they're docked, if you like, in those little holding pens. And the ships just go back and forth. Uh, they're called tainter gates by the man who invented them. And this is a photograph of, the, of St. Petersburg. Well, you can't see St. Petersburg, it's off to the left here, but here's their road, elevated highway under construction. Here is the, these two gates, and the ships will go back and forth from there. This is a photograph looking down from that Halcrow assignment. You see there, there's a set of gates, a set of gates. So what I've been proposing is that this could, this could be a multi-purpose structure. Obviously, there has to be free flow of tides in and out every day, free flow of discharge of the Hudson River. You know, so people are concerned about the ecology. You know, Malcolm, you're going to dam up the harbour. How can you do that? It's not going to flush. It's all the sewage from New York City pouring into it every day. That's right. So it cannot in any way impede the flow under normal conditions. But in the case of, as you saw from that storm surge map, the peak only lasted a few hours at high tide. Forgot to mention, you know, Sandy was really interesting because when it hit Atlantic City, it wasn't even a hurricane. It was less than a one. And the National Weather Service downgraded it to an extra tropical storm. But it was huge. It was a thousand miles across. It was moving very slowly because of that blocking high I told you about earlier. <coughs> And because it was so huge, there were howling winds down from the east, down Long Island Sound, and through up through the Verrazano Narrows. The peak surge occurred at high tide. So timing is everything for hurricanes. Because six, if, if, that, if, if Sandy had hit six hours earlier or six hours later, it would have been low tide. You'd have the same surge, but it would be starting down here, and it would, would probably be no flooding. But in addition, not only was it high tide, it was a spring tide every two weeks. You know, the sun, the moon, and the earth are in alignment. You get an extra high tide. So the spring tide, high tide, and this very unusual storm that all it was a it was a that all came together conjunction, if you like, and that's why it was so serious, even though it wasn't even a hurricane. So what what would have hap happened if it was a Category Three? Anyway. I'm finished my talk, but there's a lot of stuff about this that's been published by the media and ourselves over the last few years. There's our website. <coughs> if you can't read it, see me afterwards. But there's a lot of interesting stuff there by different newspapers, magazines, journals, and so forth. You can look at. And just to finish off, what about? I haven't mentioned a word about climate change, really. Um, and that's really a separate lecture. But sea level is rising. This is the, the rise of sea level for the last 24,000 years. This was the height of the ice age. And as the ice melted, the world's oceans came up and up and up, about 150 meters. That's about 450, 500 feet. And it kind of leveled off. And this is 2,000 years ago, so we're just in this little bit here. But all that ice that was going to melt had melted. This is more recent. This is since 1880. This is a worldwide average. And all the wiggly lines, that's because it's, it's an average of hundreds and hundreds of tidal stations around the world. These are measurements. These are not some theory. These are measurements going back uh, to the 1880s. And it's coming up. The scale here, you have to read this as centimeters. It's come up about 20 centimeters since about 1900, say. 20 centimeters is about that much. So it ain't too much, right? However... On the East Coast, things are happening much more quickly. Why? Because 
the, the, whole, the whole east coast of that continent is actually sinking down. When all, when all this ice melted from the last ice age, it relieved a huge burden of weight, and the whole Earth's crust came up. It's like sitting on a loaf of bread, fresh loaf of bread, and then you get off it, and it's squashed, but then it comes sort of rises by itself, and it tries to go back to its original configuration. So the Earth's crust is floating on the Earth's mantle. It's coming up as well, but some parts are buckling up, and some are going down. And it actually turns out it's going down on the East Coast. How much? About a foot, a hundred years. If I'm standing on the edge of the ocean, uh, say on the south shore here, and whether I'm going down or the sea's coming up, it's the same thing in terms of flooding. So that's got to be added. This, this is the New York rise. It's been measured at the battery. It's in addition to the worldwide rise. So we can expect more than our fair share of sea level rise. And how much are we going to be? Well, it ought, how much will there be by the end of this century depends on how quickly the ice cover of Greenland melts. <coughs> it's going up, it's melting quickly, but it's going, not this, this is New York, but the world average, it's going up about two millimeters a year. Doesn't sound like much, does it? Two, that, but that's, you know, that's 20 centimeters in 100, 100 years. So it's going up. Um, I'm going to time, but this is what people, the doomsayers say that New York's going to look like by the end of the century. Um, it's interesting. Uh, this was an uh, op-ed, or not an op-ed, but an editorial by the New York Times last Sunday by Bill Keller. Now, he was the executive editor of the New York Times for many years. He still writes for them. He called me up the other day. He said, I'd like to write a story. And he came out with this, ed this editorial called it The New Manhattan, or A New Manhattan Project. And if you read it, you'll s he endorses some of the things that I've been saying. Of course, there are pros and cons for all these things. But he's saying, what are we going to do with Mr. Bloomberg when he finally steps down? We don't think he'll go for a fourth term, do we? But that man has got a lot to offer. Why don't we put him in charge of a big high-level national committee to look at the problems that New York and Long Island are facing in the decades and the centuries ahead and see what we have to do. So he wants <laughs> Mr. Bloomberg to be in charge of the Manhattan Project Part 2. We'll s just keep posted. All right. In conclusion, we can expect more extreme weather events in the future as climate change takes hold. Rising sea level means that the future flooding events will be more severe than ever. What we experienced during Hurricane Sandy will occur again and again. Nothing is forever, but we must stand and fight the challenges of climate change and what it means for Long Island and Metro New York and New Jersey, of course. Eventually, we will have to abandon the island as we know it, but not in our lifetime, perhaps in our great-grandchildren's lifetime. For the next 150 years, there are many treatments we can undertake to reduce the trauma of climate change and rising seas, but they will eventually fail. Now is the time for vision, political will, and bold ideas to save our cities and communities as long as it is practicable. Thank you. interesting how that developed. I got a call the other day from um, New York City Council speaker, a woman called Christine Quinn, who has announced that she will be running for the mayor, mayoralty of New York City next year. And she's been reading some about some of our work, and she wanted some advice. And she put out a press release a few days ago about, uh, we've got to get serious, folks, that we can't just slough this off. And she wanted me to read it before it went out, so I did that. And then 
she's been talking to Senator Chuck Schumer, and he put out his own press release, was it yesterday or day before? And what, what, he, what he's proposing is to dust off some previously authorized, let's call them beach nourishment pro projects by the Army Corps of Engineers that have been approved but never funded. One of them is called the Montauk Fire Island Restoration Program. And that's been a very controversial issue for many years and it's been kind of mired. Nobody, basically nobody wants, people want the protection that nourished berms would give them, but nobody wants to have their view blocked. And that's the rub. You saw that little Dutch community, the pretty little, those little red houses and the windmills. You know, you go there, you can hear the seagulls squawking and you can hear the waves on the beach, but you cannot see it because it's behind the big wall of sand. So are people willing to trade security for loss of view? And I put this to that policeman on, at Breezy Point the other day. You know, I wasn't trying to be smart ass. I just said, you know, <coughs> given what's happened, what would, what would you say? He said, well, I would trade the view for security for my family. So that's, so, and then the Schumer's talking about, I think, some sort of uh, seawall around the southern coast of Staten Island. I don't know what the exact answer is, Doug, but this is, a, in a way, a bit of a knee-jerk reaction that... <coughs> I'm not, I'm not suggesting anybody starts pouring concrete next week, but I, what I think that the, the Army Corps of Engineers, I know it's got a bad reputation in the past, is the federal agency that is responsible for navigable waterways, and they would be the agency that would be responsible, but they take their directions from Congress. They cannot just do these things on their own, so it takes an initiative from Congress, that's where Schumer is kind of getting cranked up, I think, but it needs to be part of a bigger plan if we had put the storm surge barriers that I've told you about tonight in place, if they were properly built, there would have been no flooding, there would have been no damage. Um, so I know that's a provocative thing to say, but so we'll have to wait and see. But I want to make, I want to try and get in touch with them pretty soon because we don't want them roaring off, you know, doing the wrong thing. Chris, are you in charge here? No, you can, you can feel them from here on out. We'll start here. Interesting question because, you know, statistics are built on multiple happenings of something. Now, all state insurance could tell you very accurately what is the chance of a 24-year-old unmarried male living in Brooklyn, driving a red Camaro, who is going to have a crash this year. Not an individual, <coughs> but statistically. They can tell you why, how can they do that? Because hundreds of thousands of 24-year-old unmarried males ride, riding, driving red Camaros around the country crash. So you build up some accurate statistics, and that's what your premiums are based on, right? right. Now look at the, these extreme weather events. You know, if you look back, uh, you know, in 1985 we had Gloria, and then 1992 we had the winter nor'easter, then in 1999 we had Floyd, and then we had, you know, we didn't have Katrina up here, but there, now we have Irene, and then we have Sandy. So we've had about five events in our living memory, right? Now, they teach you in Statistics 101 at Stony Brook, you cannot get reliable statistics as five numbers. You know, if I take one, two, three, four, five, and say, I'm going to average the height, and that's, that's the average height of the human race. It's not true, right? Because the sample's too small. So. The answer is, these are kind of uh, seat of the pants kind of best guesses. And I don't think there's anybody on the planet who can tell you what you just asked me. Ask the question again. I'll see if I can do it. <laughs> Where would you determine it at? The one in 500? Well, what, I mean, seriously, from what, what you can do, you can take the little storms, 10 year, roughly 10 years, because, you know, we've seen a lot of those. We've got better statistics, right? Five years, even better. 5, 10, 15, 25, and you can see that the storms get, the surges and the winds go up and up and up. So you, you do what's called ex extrapolation. You know what extrapolation means? You interpolate between two numbers, like 1 and 3, and the average is what? 2. That's called interpolation. But if you have 1, 3, 5, what's the next one out here? Well, you might say it's 7, but as you go further away, ooh, 
may be off. So let's get, but the Dutch do it. They protect their cities against a one in a thousand year storm, and I bet there's no one in Holland who's lived a thousand years. So, and even get, get this, ten thousand year storm. I mean, that even goes beyond biblical storms. So how do they do it? They just get their red line and their market, and they just go up and up. up. So I don't know. All I can say is that as the years go by, the weather extremes are going to get more intense: droughts, and heavy rainfalls, and storms. You know, that's the best we can do at the moment. Let's go along the roads. Yep. If from, from, from your point of view, is there any benefit to continuing the jetties all the way down continuously? The whole South Island. Now? Pardon? Just repeat the question. Well, the question is, you know, we have these uh, sporadic, let's call them arrays of jetties sticking out of the South Coast, and they benefit some people and they cause other problems. Um, I think your question is, should we just do the whole South Coast? Well, that's called resilience. That's really what New York City's short-term fix it. And it might be a good idea, because it, it does actually broaden the beaches, right? And that would give you an extra measure of protection. But you can't do it in a half-assed way. I mean, you can't do a bunch of them and then run out of money, and then all those communities to the west get starved. And that's what happened to uh, an old, what was it called? Pikes Inlet in 1992 broke through. It was just west of the starvation point. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to make note of the fact that there is a policy that was created by the Obama administration um, now about two years old, I believe. Almost about two years old. It's called the National Ocean Policy. Are you aware of that? Two years ago? He signed it as a pres presidential decree two years ago. What does it say? I don't know. The National Ocean Policy is to develop nine regional planning bodies throughout the United States So, because you know, I think Obama's now going to be moving into a second term, and people are hoping he'll be much more aggressive about uh, addressing climate change issues and all those things that you talk about are all involved, uh, including population growth, which is our number one problem. Yeah, but when you take the threat multiple of climate change, those numbers go out the window. You well, we're trying to go out the window, but the I know that, that's that's the that's the scary part. All true. Yes. Um, this infrastructure in the ocean near the um, shoreline, you know, gas pipeline, you know, one of those, more of that, right? It's, it's surge and more extreme weather. Is that affecting the infrastructure that they have? Already in place? Well, it, well, it does. It depends how deep. You mean the storms like Sandy? Yeah. Well, it does. It depends how deep these pipelines are buried and how, especially where they come up on the beach, you know, how far back from the water's edge and how deep they are. So, yes, that, that could easily happen. If, if there's enough scouring that it eats away at the sand surrounding those pipelines, they will fracture. Well, I don't know enough about where they are and how deep they are to really make much of an intelligent comment. I'll like to see that later. No. Oh. Oh. We'll have to look at that carefully.
but it actually it might surprise you, but it doesn't it hardly goes up at all because it really spreads over the whole ocean on the East Coast. But in terms of your comment about soft solutions, I fully agree with you. Most of my talks about New York City, where there are 520 miles of coastline, but it's all bulkheaded. There's very few places, maybe Jamaica Bay is one, where you can strengthen the natural protection by planting wetlands, and the city is doing that, the Army Corps is doing that. And I'm not suggesting these, these, these barriers would be any solution for the rest of Long Island. We're really talking about the metro New York, where there's that huge density of people, and there is that already hardened shoreline. So I don't think... All those things. You better. Um, no, you should take my class on oceanography. But no, I mean, I'm not trying to be silly because you know it depends whether the wave breaks over the wall. If you look at the Dutch, they realise that they cannot have an impervious system. So maybe 20% of those waves actually spill over to the inside. But you're talking about having them closed for just a few hours. So it's not as if you're going to flood the inside. Um, it's interesting, there, there is a big, uh, big philosophical divide bet between, say, the engineers on one hand and the environmentalists on the other. And the engineers, the environmentalists sort of think the engineers are crude people who want to put brute force methods and pour concrete, and the engineers see the environmentalists as being sort of naive and having unrealistic ideas. I personally try and bridge that void myself and bring them together, but. Um, there's no perfect solution. I think we're going to actually have to, uh, there's another group that's supposed to use the room <coughs> at 9 o'clock, believe it or not. So what, what time are we now? <laughs> we're at 9 o'clock. If Malcolm is available for questions, I'll ask him to, to go out into the, and take them in the lobby, though. Um, I, I, I will say again, if you're new here tonight, we have an email list. We have a great seminar series. I'd love to see you all come to it uh, in the future. On December 7th is our final one on climate change and fisheries. Um, but please join me in giving Malcolm a hand. <laughs> for a very informative and, and entertaining talk. And uh, again, I encourage you, Malcolm will be available for questions in the lobby. And uh, thank you all for coming. Good thank night. you.